Yeah. Well, what's interesting about the Greek of Homer? Well, I'm afraid it's another one of those let me count the ways um, kind of answers. The language itself is, is uh, well known, widely believed to be a hodgepodge. You have about four different dialects of Greek um, that are uh, expressed in Homer. There are forms that are clearly invented for use by Homer. Uh, not invented exactly, but exploited, where there, in normal speech there were other uh, forms used. Uh, for those who know a little Greek, they're contract verbs that didn't fit the meter, about which more later. And he invented uh, or exploited a way of, of uh, making those verbs with the ending isdo, uh, which is interesting just because it's still productive in English. It's where we get all of our isms. Um, it comes from a metrical need in Homer. Um, from the point of view of language, it seems to show, uh, the Homeric poems show a kind of, um, what do you call that, uh, an appetite for variety, which um, I personally, it could be attributed to a number of things. I attribute to a musical ear. Uh, Shakespeare also had such an ear where uh, you looking for forms from all of the kinds of Greek expression that you know that will work for your musical purposes and your semantic purposes. Uh, but there's a lot more to be said. Uh, I mean, the great controversy about Homeric uh, poetry stems from certain peculiarities of his language, in particular repetition. Um, to literary tastes, repetition is not literary. <laughs> you don't repeat something that you, that, you know, if you can write it down, you don't need to repeat it. It struck literary uh, critics as coming from a primitive background. Uh, it's hard for me to be, the poli be polite about that because, um, you know, these same literary critics grew up inside of one of the really great musical traditions the world has known. Uh, that is a, a, a Western tonal music, where um, repetition is everywhere. You, uh, I mean, the, almost the definition of meaninglessness in music is a lack of repetition. I mean, imagine a melody that never came back. That is almost like a, a, a recipe, if you will, uh, for madness. Uh, but repeating a melody creates context, creates a meaningful thing even if with music you're not completely sure what it means. Uh, but it, 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 you'd go mad if music never repeated. <clears throat> so, um, either Homer repeats certain lines and phrases, which came to be called formulas, because he's primitive, uh, because actually what Homer is, and this is the prevailing theory, uh, is a, a kind of end product of a tradition of oral bards who composed with these set formulas that allowed them to compose extemporaneously because you had these formulas, sort of like um, the way commentators work a baseball game. You know, there are certain set phrases you can use and throw in for every, um, every event. Um, or for example, when people read the news, things never just go wrong, they always go terribly wrong. You know, it's a formulaic phrase, and it helps in the sort of running commentary. Uh, it's this sort of theory that, uh, that pr prevails still as a kind of uh, doctrine rather than a theory, that uh, says that the Homeric poems grew up out of a tradition uh, that is one bard handing on to a next generation and so on, and amongst themselves, one presumes, uh, a story that grew in the telling. Um, and so either Homer comes from that or there's repetition in Homer because he's like Bach. I probably don't have to tell you which one I think uh, it is. Now, in both cases, you have a phenomenon called ring composition. Um, ring composition is when uh, you, know, you begin a story or begin a, a, a statement 
with a, a certain uh, line and you dig deep into the story and you come back by ending with the same line or a similar line. So you tie a ring around it. You find this, I mean, I've read all of these uh, kind of um, oral exemplars of this. People who tell stories uh, who are not literate who use this technique of ring composition. It's partly just an aesthetic thing. It's partly a mnemonic thing, perhaps. Um, but it's also there, ring composition, as I said, in Bach, or Mozart, or Beethoven, in the most sophisticated uh, Baroque, without equivocation, uh, forms of art that uh, people have invented. Uh, so the question is really, <laughs> is Homer composed extemporaneously uh, from formulas by an anonymous tradition over God knows how many years, a thing that no one has actually observed and no one has ever tried to do to compose Homeric poetry spontaneously. Uh, where, uh, uh, or is it you know, a finished work of art? Uh, there's an in-between ground as well, which I think is most more like what I subscribe to, that I said earlier what Homer knew was battle poetry, not battle. Um, what she also knew was uh, oral composition. She knew bards and minstrels. They're depicted in the, uh, in the poems. They're not people who are reciting from a text. They're composing spontaneously uh, with a, a guitar-like instrument. And these were uh, Bob Dylan's, right, I mean, of the time, singing tales of heroes. Um, but that doesn't mean that's what Homer was. Homer, Homer's texts are far too long to be um, performed at one sitting. They're uh, you know, on the scale of Wagner's Ring. Um, evidence from the ancient world was that they were performed in set pieces by um, groups of artists called rhapsodes. This is um, a Plato wrote a piece called the Ion, which is about um, a rhapsode named Ion, uh, who um, he makes this uh, famous analogy that uh, the rhapsode is like, in, in relation to the poet, in relation to the muse, it's like those iron filings hanging from a magnet. I think it's the first use of the magnet as an analogy, and it's in Plato's Ion. Um, and a, a rhapsode is quite literally a song stitcher. He's somebody who composes an evening of work by cutting and pasting, or really cutting and sewing. Not so long ago, um, this was the practice uh, in classical music performance. That even at the turn of a hundred years ago, an evening was not composed of whole pieces uh, as they were conceived by the composer and written by the composer, but you picked one movement from this, another movement from that. Part of the art of stitching together a rhapsody in the modern sense was um, uh, your, your sense of taste in putting together different movements from different pieces. But at a certain point, <clears throat> as this classical musical tradition developed, there was a demand, I think, which came from the audience for the whole piece uh, as it was conceived by the composer to be performed in order. And I think there was a similar moment in Athens uh, uh, in an event called the Pisistratean recension. Uh, Pisistratus was one of the tyrants of, of, of Athens, <coughs> excuse me, and um, although uh, there are scholars who are uh, mostly of the school who think um, that Homer was composed orally and there's no really important aspect to the textual uh, uh, transmission of Homer compared to this oral creation of Homer, um, Th those people deny that there was an important event like this, that Pisistratus put together a text of Homer. But I think, in the way I imagine it, I don't know how to really argue the, the point historically, uh, there was a call at a certain point for um, legitimate whole texts of Homer that must come from a knowledge in the people of what they were. Um, so, uh, but 
the question about language then comes down to, you know, is Homer, is there repetition in Homer because there had to be so that the composers of Homer could remember where they were, not lose their place, and so on? Or is it there because uh, Homer is musical and uh, you don't explain repetition in music any more than, as I say, you explain wetness in water? Oh, um, <clears throat> yeah, um, uh, I said uh, before I would talk about catalogs, and uh, this fits in because um, many of you who've, uh, all of you who've read the Iliad uh, will very likely have skipped the catalog of ships. So you'd have started it, blah, 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 and <laughs> get the point, right? Um, but imagine what a catalogue is if you conceive of it as danced poetry. Right? Um, you have a group of dancers linking hands, dancing in the round in a fixed rhythm, which is the rhythm of Homeric uh, verse. I, mean, I hope I can demonstrate that for you. And in fact, I'm, I'm, there's some video uh, on my website, danceofthemuses.org, that um, demonstrates this. Uh, but, you know, one possibility for this reconstruction. But um, if you're dancing out these names as they're being sung in a circle dance, what you're doing is conjuring the people. Uh, this is like, um, well, what is that? It, uh, in, uh, it's got a bad uh, reputation. Well, it's a seance. I mean, it, it's, it, it's the magic of circle dancing bringing into the present in a space you're creating uh, these revenant beings, the dead, in other words, who uh, one imagines as one's dancing. This is documented, you know, uh, in other traditions of circle dancing, that they feel the presence of their ancestors among them as they move, amongst them as they move. Again, such lists are occur all over the world. Um, it was a list of a genealogical list that was, you know, behind, um, I'm forgetting his name now, um, uh, the man who wrote the book Roots, Alex Haley. Uh, it was a, a, an orally preserved list that allowed him to uh, rediscover his roots. Um, genealogies occur throughout scripture. And that's a principal reason for these lists is genealogical. But a list is just a list, and in this case, the catalog of ships, <coughs> which means list of ships, is a, um, uh, a kind of accounting uh, of, of, of the ships, uh, and the, the, the captains, the warriors, <coughs> really account and catalog are um, cognate words, one's Latin, one's Greek. Uh, and we, we have in our own language, in our own usage, we have the word recount or account. I mean, it's, it, there's something about storytelling and counting that's very important somehow. It's betrayed or exhibited by the words we choose to describe it. Uh, I think there's a connection between tally and tale, for example. <laughs> but, um, okay, you're going through a list of things. Let's imagine a list of events. First this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And you say, and this happened. Uh, he, uh, and he was the one who did this. He, who, blah, 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 blah. You tell a story about him, and you circle back to the line you started with. That's the ring that closes off the insertion. Then you go back to the next element in the list. So uh, uh, the way I understand it, you have a way of uh, the, uh, the ring composition serves this idea of interpolating within a list of things. Right, so um, ring composition there has an origin of necessity. Like if you want to expand on um, the, the stories behind the list, you have to do it in a ring so that you can get back to your place. You won't forget your place. If you come back to the same line you left the list from, you can then go on to the next element. Otherwise, you're going to forget it. But um, as in so many things, uh, I think Homer turned a virtue out of necessity. 
so that ring composition in him really has become uh, like ring composition in Bach and Mozart, uh, who also came directly from folk traditions in round dance, folk and court traditions in round dance. The rhythms, I mean, uh, some, um, was it a conductor in Roger Norrington once pointed out you could dance your way through the entire St. Matthew Passion of Bach. Now that doesn't mean you should do it. <laughs> it would be an interesting thing to try. But uh, really, it, there's so much art involved there that you want to sit and listen. That's what happened in Homer's case, pure and simple. I don't see why we need another explanation for why there's repetition in Homer. Uh, we have the important evidence that he was captivating, and he still is. And he still is even when you don't hear all these elements of rhythm, repetition, and so on. Many translators uh, cut out repetitions because they feel they get in the way of the narrative. The amazing thing is the narrative still works. and People still read Homer. Even if they're forced to as part of a great books program, it's typically one of the favorites.